we all today. Let's stand as we begin our time of worship with the reading of God's Word. This comes from uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Lord, we bear them no more. And so praise the Lord that, that we are free of all of our sin, our past, present, and future sin, nailed to the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we, Lord, we praise you, Lord, this morning, knowing that we have a blessed hope, the blessed hope of eternal life. Lord, knowing that you went to the cross, but, Lord, you went to the tomb, and you only borrowed that tomb for a few days. And, Lord, then you arose from the grave, defeated death, hell, and grave, and you are alive, seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father this morning, making intercession for us. Father, we pray this morning that your, your spirit, Lord, that you would just saturate uh, this place, this sanctuary. And, Father, that you would be here in our midst, and in, 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 that your presence, Lord, would be here this morning. Lord, that we would worship you here in this place in spirit and in truth. Lord, we'll give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Why? Because you alone are worthy. You are the worthy Lamb of God. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> Continue to stand if you're able this morning. The singing church. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The Jesus 
church, you are dismissed at this time. Take your Bible if you would and turn with me over to the book of Colossians, all right? New Testament, Colossians, and uh, we'll get there eventually. Just bear with me, all right? We're going to look at several uh, passages of Scripture here uh, before we get there, but we'll make our, our journey into uh, Colossians here in just a moment. We're, uh, listen, we're in uh, one of my favorite times of the year, all right? And it's that time where we set aside, uh, intentionally set aside, uh, about three weeks of fasting and praying and just uh, seeking God's direction that we have uh, in our lives. And, uh, and listen, you say, well, uh, I, I've already missed that because we're, we're starting our second week, all right? We started this back last Monday. And you say, well, shucks, I'm already, I'm already a, a week behind. That's okay. It's not too late, all right? You can uh, get started with us today in fasting and praying and then uh, joining in with us. Now, uh, let me just mention this, all right, as you're finding Colossians. And these are on the table out there in the foyer. Uh, and then I emailed it. It's also on our church website. So if you've got access all around. But I want you to take one of these or take two or three of them. I, I make plenty of copies. And, uh, and this is a, a Bible reading plan that uh, I picked up from the state, the TBC, the Tennessee Baptist Convention, uh, one of them that they suggested. There is a, a, a prayer guide as well, personal uh, prayer guide on there. Uh, that's the second page. The third page is the Bible reading plan. It is a chronological plan. And folks, uh, they're only having you read about two, not even about three chapters a day, all right? And so two chapters a day doesn't take you very long, but you can read those. There are memory verses as well. And let me encourage you to work on and memorizing the Word of God. And then what I did is I have incorporated uh, a weekly uh, prayer guide as well. So this past week, uh, if you joined in with us, uh, then you were praying every day specifically for the, uh, the country of Malawi, all right? And you say, why in the world was I praying for Malawi? Well, that's where some of our shoeboxes are on their way to, all right? They're not there yet. At least as far as I know, they're not there yet, okay? Uh, it takes a few months for those shoeboxes to get over there, overseas to those countries, and then for them to have <coughs> their... Uh, their distribution events, okay? And uh, so there's a prayer guide there. And then the next page, so this week, starting tomorrow, okay? Monday, January the 10th, there is a prayer guide here for this coming week. And our focus this week will be for Ukraine. Uh, some of our boxes are on their way to the country of Ukraine. And so I want you to be in prayer this week for those boxes on their way to Ukraine, all right? And then, again, if you didn't join in with us last week, you can go back and uh, join in and pray for Malawi and, uh, and that country as well, all right? Our theme this year and uh, for our, our time of fasting and praying is real simple. The theme is to hide, seek, and share. Hide, seek, and share, all right? And uh, last week, we kind of talked about the hiding part. Jesus told us over in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, when you pray, he says, you don't be like those that stand out there in the open. He says, you go to your prayer closet, all right? You go to a secret room, all right? And so what I suggested last week is that for this year, the fasting part may not necessarily be where you are fasting from a food, but you fast from something, okay? You give up a physical thing, whether it's television, social media, internet, like whatever, all right? But you give up something, and then you go and you get along with God. Go into a closet. Go into a room where it's nothing else. Don't even take your phone in there with you, all right? And so you go, and you get along with God. You have that secret hideout, and you pray, and you read, and you study the Word of God. You have your devotion with Him. And so last week, we looked at this, 
And we said this, quit trying to hide our sin, but instead we need to hide his word in our hearts so that we do not sin against God. And so work on the hiding. And now this week, today, my aim is to seek, all right? Hide, seek, and share. And so if you follow along, then next week I'm probably going to try to focus on the sharing part of our thing. But today, I want to look at the, the, the idea of seeking God. Now, when I was working on this, there are several verses that automatically came to my mind that talks about seeking and, and what it says, what it means to seek. I want to go through these real quickly, all right, before we get into uh, Colossians here in just a moment. But the first, one of the first verses that came to my mind was Isaiah 55, 6. And uh, Isaiah 55, 6, look at what it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now, the, I, I'm not going to take the time this morning to really break down all these verses, but I want you to understand, though, that verse, there is an implication in that verse. There's actually two implications. Seek the Lord while he may be found. In other words, there is coming a time when he won't be found, okay? You better seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him when. While he is near. So in other words, the implication of there is a time coming when he will not be near. So you better call upon him while he is near. Now, another verse that came to my mind was Jeremiah 29, 13. And you know this. I mean, this is one of these verses <coughs> that we mention quite often. You will seek me and you will find me when you search uh, for me with what? With all your heart, seeking God, seeking the Lord with all your heart. Another verse that came to my mind was Psalm 34, verse 10. And I love this. This is one of my favorite verses. Uh, I love Psalm 34. And, and it says, the young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Can I just say this in the context of I'm asking you, I'm encouraging you to spend the next couple of weeks in a time of fasting and praying. And you say, well, fasting, that means I've got to give up something. And if I give that up, I just don't know if I can live without it. Yes, you can. All right? You can live without it. Because the Bible says when you seek the Lord, put in first, all right? Seek the Lord and you will not lack any good thing. And then these verses, I love these verses. Psalm 105, verse 3. Look at what it says here. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. And then verse 4 tells us exactly what to do. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Seek him in the morning. Seek him in the noontime. Seek him all the day long. But seek his face forevermore. Over in Matthew chapter 13, I didn't give you this one, all right, brother? Don't want you to panic up there, all right? But over in Matthew chapter 13, uh, it's a parable. And Jesus gives a parable where he compares the kingdom of heaven to a merchant who is seeking a beautiful pearl. And then you remember what Jesus said, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. These are the, uh, the very words of our Savior. Jesus says, for the Son of Man has come to what? To seek and to save that which was lost. And then John chapter 4 verse 23. Look at what the Bible says. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. And then you know this verse. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. You better listen to me now. There is someone or somebody that is seeking you. And, and I'm just not talking about Jesus, all right? 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, he is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Devour. You know what that word devour there means? It means he wants to annihilate you. He wants to consume you. He wants to destroy you, all right? Anything about you. And so he is seeking whom he may devour. Let me ask you a question this morning. What are you seeking? 
What are you seeking? I, I was reading a few weeks ago in Genesis, and, and we're reading through Genesis in this Bible reading plan, and, and, and I was working ahead a little bit and came across an interesting question. You ever notice that there are some very interesting questions in the Bible, all right? And, and I always just kind of perk up when I read these questions. And there was a question over in Genesis chapter 37. It was talking about Joseph, and, and it says, What are you seeking? And when I read that, I thought, wow, what are we seeking? What are you seeking this morning? Do you even know what you're searching for? Do you even know what you're looking for? You say, I don't know. How many of you remember the old candid camera episodes? Yeah, some of you uh, <clears throat> not so young people, all right? Y'all remember those, don't you? The candid camera? Well, in a candid camera episode, uh, there was an actor that was out on a busy sidewalk and he begins just kind of looking at the ground. He walks around for a little bit. And while he's walking around, he just continues to look down. And people are passing by him. And they're just kind of giving him some funny looks and some strange looks. And after a couple of minutes then, he decides to get down on his hands and his knees. knees and he begins just kind of feeling around on the ground with his hands. And people now, well, they, they're really kind of wondering what in the world is going on with this guy. And they're slowing down and, and they just kind of stop and they're watching him and they're wondering what is he doing. And finally then, somebody else, they stop and, and they start looking on the ground as well. And, and then another one begins searching the sidewalk. And in just a few minutes, it didn't take very long, the camera shows a dozen or so people that are around this guy and they're all looking down and some of them are even down on their hands and their knees just like that guy looking for something. Well, at that point, the actor who got all this started in the first place, well, he quietly, he just kind of gets up without anybody else paying attention and walks away. Nobody else even notices that he has led. <clears throat> and there they are. They're so intent in their search that they have never even bothered to ask what it is they were looking for. Isn't that like us? I mean, think about it. I, I believe that is a good, pe a good picture of how of so many people that live in our society today. That's how they live. They're, they're, they're searching for something, and they're searching because they know there's got to be something more than this life. Amen? They know that there's something else out there, but they'll never find it if they don't know what it is that they're missing. They're missing something, but they're just not sure so look at Colossians chapter 3, all right? And uh, Colossians chapter 3, I'm, I'm going to give you just two things this morning, okay? I, so this is not your typical three-point message, okay? I'm going to give you two things. And as we're looking at and, and really just kind of thinking about that question, what are you seeking? What are you searching for? Are you even sure that you know what's missing in your life. Paul writes this letter to the church at Colossus and, and, and more. Boy, I mean, this is just, a, it's a fascinating letter. It is a power-packed letter. So many good things that Paul writes in this letter to the church at Colossus. And I, I'm going to give you just two things. First of all, you need to seek the things above. Seek the things above. Now, uh, actually, before we get into Colossians chapter 3, you've got to back up to Colossians chapter 2 because there is a verse in chapter 2 where the opening phrase in chapter 3 parallels right along with it. So look at Colossians 2 and uh, look at verse 20, all right? Colossians 2, 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ. Uh, understand those words there. If you died with Christ. Now, again, I, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. And now look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If, if then you were raised 
with Christ. You see how these go together? Colossians 2 20, if you died with Christ, <clears throat> okay, but now in chapter 3, verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ. And, and so understand what he's saying here. Uh, Colossians 3 1, it, it, it establishes the truth that we have been raised with Christ, and since we have been raised with Christ, there is a new status, all right? That there is a new way of life. The, listen, if there's a, what you think about baptism, right? And baptism is a, a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, but it's also a, a symbolic picture of the new life that a new believer has, right? That they go under the water. That's, that's death. And then they are raised. The old is gone, right? And the new has come. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You died with Christ, but you are alive. You have been raised with Christ. And so the old is gone, and the new has come. There, and, and so because of this, listen, there is a uh, what we might call a resurrection power. We have a power source. For living. As a believer, you have died with Christ. You have been buried with Him, but then you have been raised with Him as well. This speaks of our position in Christ. And even though this is our position, we must appropriate these truths on a daily basis. If we want to live that, that power uh, packed life, all right, that the gospel tells us about. If we want to break free from the past, then we have to appropriate the fact that we are dead to sin, we are dead to the old self, and we are dead to all of that, and we have died with Christ, but we are raised with Christ in the new life. Now look at what he says here in verse 1. You are raised with Christ. And he says this, he says, seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. And then in, in verse 2, look at what he says. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Paul writes here two things. He says, seek the things, those things which are above. And then he says to set your mind or to set your heart on those things above. I'm sure that you've heard this phrase before. I know I have said this phrase. That he is so heavenly minded that he is no what? Earthly good. You ever heard that? That he is so heavenly minded that he is of no earthly good. Well, now I, I guess that is possible. It's more likely that people today are so worldly minded that they are no heavenly good. If, if we would truly set our hearts on things above, if we get our minds off of just everything in this world, all of the temporary stuff, if we would seek the things that are above, if we would do that, listen, <clears throat> if we would set our minds and our hearts, then we would experience the resurrection power and a living and a freedom here on this earth that Christ intends for us to have and to live. The word set there, that word set, when he says set your mind, the word set there, it means to seek something out with a desire to possess it. That's what it means. That you are seeking something and you have a desire to what? To own it. To possess it. It's a focus. Listen. If our focus. If our focus is on things of this earth. Things that are ultimately going to rust. Tarnish. Break down. Burn up. If, if our focus is on those things. Then guess what? Our energy and our emotions are misplaced. Paul says. Set your mind on things above. Seek those things Above, seek out Christ. Allow Christ to become the ultimate treasure. 
That you want Him above everything else. And if you will seek Him, then guess what? You will find Him when you seek Him with what? With all your heart. Knowing. <clears throat> Look at what? Go back to verse 1, all right? Look at what He says here. In verse 1, seek those things which are above where Christ is. I love that. Aren't you glad Paul put that part in there? Where Christ is. You don't know where Christ is? He's above, right? He is seated at the right hand of God. Listen, that is important. When you understand that, that provides for you and I a much needed reminder that Jesus is alive, that he is supreme, and that he is still in control. Jesus. We, have exalt, we exalt him, all right? It says that he is sitting at the right hand of God. You know what that tells us? It tells us that the redemptive work is now complete. He went to the cross. He rose from the dead. And now he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Our feet, listen, our feet must be on earth, but our minds must be in heaven. Think about that. Your feet must be on earth, but your mind needs to be in heaven. Look at what he says here in verses 1 and 2, all right? <clears throat> he says here, seek those things above. Set your mind on things above. When he says this, uh, in verse 2 here, the command, Paul is commanding us to concentrate and direct our thoughts on the things that are eternal, not the temporary Concentrate. In other words, your concern is on the eternal and not the temporary. There's a similarity in these two commands, all right? And the two commands in verse 1 when he says, seek those things. In verse 2, to set your mind. There's a similarity here. And it reinforces their impact. Listen, the first one, in verse 1, when he says to seek, that, that suggests a striving. He ever just, <clears throat> you ever go out to look for something and you look for a few minutes and, and you know, you're trying to find it but you don't find it and what do you do? You just kind of give up, right? And then you go back in and you say, well, I couldn't find it. I'll just go buy a new one, right? That's what we do. I, I, I do this all the time, you know, when Luke, I, it, when, when he's missed, when he's lost something, misplaced something, I say, go find it. Go, go look for it. And he'll go look for it in 30 seconds. It'll only take 30 seconds. I can't find it. And you didn't look. That word seek there means to strive. You are going to seek with all your heart. You're going to seek to what? To possess it. And then in verse 2, when he says set your mind, that suggests their concentration. Concentration uh, in other words, you must not only seek heaven, you must think heaven. Heaven must be in our thoughts. <clears throat> in order to change your actions, you must first change your beliefs and your way of thinking. And when you change your way of thinking, then in due time, your actions, and in due course, your actions are going to change. Behavior follows belief. In other words, think, think of it like this. Your thoughts will influence your actions. So if it's your thoughts that influences your actions, if we will place our thoughts on things above, set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, then guess what? Our behavior, our actions are going to reflect those things that are eternal, the things that matter to God. The Colossians, the believers there at Coloss, <clears throat> we can identify with them. We, we really can. You see, listen, it, it wasn't very long after uh, their, their new life had begun that their thoughts, their energy, their time was focused more on themselves. They, they were saved, all right? They understood all that, but they were not living as as they were to be living, all right? <clears throat> and so listen to this, all right? St. Augustine, uh, this, is a, this is a powerful quote. St. Augustine said this, 
Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. We sang it this morning. Lord, Jesus, you are my what? You are my all in all. Did you mean that? Or did you just sing the words? Augustine says Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. Do you value your Savior above everything else? If you do, you're going to seek him. You're going to seek him with all your heart. Now, you know what Satan wants to do, right? Satan wants to kid us, and he's doing a good job of it, okay? He has us so occupied. He has us so preoccupied with the things of this earth, the things of this world, that our mind, <clears throat> and that's what we're doing. We're spending all of our time, all of our energy, all of our resources simply chasing the temporary, the things of this world. The devil, he'll tell us. He'll say, well, well, if you seek the things above, you're going to miss out on the things below. Now, that's not necessarily true. I don't think that's true. Because my Bible says God owns it all. And if God owns it all, then when I seek the things above, it doesn't mean I have to abstain from earthly things. It just means that I use the earthly things for His glory. All right? <clears throat> That's what He's saying. That, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. So listen. Think about the church of Colossae here, verse 1. If you were what? Raised with Christ. I, I can't answer that for you this morning. I hope, though, every single one of you other side of my voice can say, Yes, I know I'm born again. I know I'm a child of God. I am dead to the self. I am dead to the old way of life. I put my faith and trust in Jesus. I've been raised with Him. I am raised with Christ. And since I am raised with Christ, I am going to seek the things that are above. I'm going to quit putting my earthly priorities in control. That Listen, that's what that was the problem with the church at Colossus. Their, their priorities were out of whack. Don't you think it's time for you and I to adjust our priorities? To get our priorities straight? Don't you think it's time that we focus our time and our attention and our life on Christ? All the things above that are found in Christ. Have you ever stopped to think, I, listen, this is this, this kind of baffles me a little bit, all right? Verse 1. Seek those Things. What things? Those things which are above. What things are above? I mean, Paul, why does he have to get so generic there, so general? What, what things are you talking about? Listen, it's all the things that are above that are found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Things that this world can give you and things that this world can take away. I'm talking about the love of God. Amen? I'm talking about grace. The grace of God. And the mercy of God. And the compassion. And His righteousness. And His holiness. And His wisdom. And His understanding. The truth. The justice. The courage. The boldness. The faith. The hope. The sound mind. The love. The light. All of these things that are above. See those things. Praise Him. Worship Him, those things that are above. Now, does that mean that we don't need to be concerned with the things of this earth? No, listen. Yeah, I, you need to have a concern for the things of this earth. What I'm saying, though, is this, is that's not our main priority. Our main priority ought to be what? Seeking the things which are above and not our earthly, temporary things. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Uh, he'll pull it up for us here. This is Jesus on the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You know this verse. What, did, what does Jesus say? Seek ye first, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Can, can I just put a little plug in right here? 
You want to know how, how much better your life would be if we would just do that right there? You know what? That's really what it comes down to. It comes down to self or the Savior. Am I going to humble myself? Am I going to surrender myself and live under the Lordship of my Savior and seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Or am I going to seek self? Am I going to be on the throne? Am I going to do what I want to do and live how I want to live and have things my way? Am I going to be the master of my domain? Am I, is it going to be my goals and my dreams? Well, if it is, you're in for a world of hurt. But listen to me. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that when by reading the Word of God and just watching people, <coughs> that the, the people that are truly content in this life are those who have realized that this world ain't their home. The people that are truly content right now are those who understand that this world is not where it's at. That they are seeking the kingdom of God. They're seeking His righteousness first. On the other hand, you find those that they're never happy. They are always frustrated about something. They go out and they, the possessions, the things they buy, the things they purchase, whether they're just never quite enough, or it's not what they're supposed to be. The relationships they form are never satisfying, and they're never as they thought they would be. The dreams that they pursue are never as fulfilling as they hoped that they would be. And so they're in just a constant cycle or state of misery. I, I believe, listen, I believe that's why the Lord and why Paul says in Colossians 3, 1 here, I believe that's why exactly why Paul says to set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above and seek the things above. People today, listen, people today, they're so bogged down with the world. They're so bogged down with the things of this world. Their, their stomachs are churning. Their brows are furrowing. Their hearts are breaking. Why? Because they're living for nothing more than the temporary. And they give no thought to the eternal. If you'll finally understand that heaven is where it's all at, then you'll be free to enjoy life now. Understand that, amen? Heaven is where it's all about. Number two is this. Not only do you seek the things above, but you're going to find life in Christ. When you seek things above, then you're going to find life is in no one else than Jesus Christ. Go to verse 3. Colossians 3, 3. For you died. Here he is back to this dying part, right? In verse 1 it was if you were raised. And now he goes back to this dying. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love how this just all comes together with hide, seek, and share. I, I really didn't plan all this, all right? I did start praying and praying for this, okay, a couple of weeks ago. Your life, what life? Your life in Christ, okay? As a born-again believer, the life that you have, Jesus is your life, Amen. We were, we were alluding to this a little bit in our Sunday school class this morning. Because we were looking at kind of a, an interesting chapter in our book about how Jesus is the pioneer of life. And I never really thought about Jesus as the pioneer of life. But that word pioneer is the word originator. It's the word for author. It's the word for founder. Jesus said, I am the way and the what? Truth and the life. Jesus is life. If you have Jesus, you have life. And so he says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. <clears throat> this looks back. Paul is taking us back to the cross where we died positionally in Christ. And listen, if you died with Christ, 
There is no reason to return to the old life. Are you with me? The old life is dead. Why in the world do you want to return to the old life? You've died with Christ. There should be a very little desire in our new life for an improper, worldly pleasure as, you know, that we shouldn't have that. Listen, the old nature is gone. It is put to death. Some people will say this, oh, well, well, you know, you got Jesus and, and he just renewed you or he reformed you. No, no, no. My friend, no. The old is gone. The old life is dead. You have died and you have been raised to new life in Christ. He says our life is hidden with Christ. What does that mean? Think back to what he said in verse 1. Where is Christ at? Where is Christ? He is sitting at the right hand of God. Okay? To have our lives hidden with the one who is seated at the right hand of God, you know what that does? That gives me two things. Security and satisfaction. To know that my life is hidden with Christ and Christ is seated at the right hand of God, hey, listen, that ought to bring a joy and a satisfaction to my heart and my life. And then it brings a security. Security. There's an assurance there, a blessed assurance. The image here, when he says there that your life is hidden with Christ, the image here is like a seed that is buried in the earth, just like that seed that is planted and buried in the earth, our real lives are hidden from the world. And they will only be revealed when Christ returns. And then go to verse 4. Look at what he says in verse 4. When Christ, I, 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 I love it when the scripture says stuff like this. When Christ, who is our life? Who is our life? Christ. Okay? Jesus. Jesus is life. He is our life. See, some people would like to say this. Well, I, Jesus is a part of my life. If he is a part of your life, he ain't your life. You can't say that. You can't say that you got saved, you got Jesus, and he is a, a part of your life. Like, this is a part of my life, and this is a part of my life, and Jesus is a little part of my life. No. He is your life. It's all or nothing. Are you with me, church? This means yes, all right? It's all or nothing. When Christ, who is our life, what? Appears. Christ is our life. Christ is what life is all about. It, it, listen, without him, without him, you don't have life. You're dead in your sins. By realizing that Christ is our life, we can have a new attitude. A new attitude about no matter what happens to us, we know that that life that we have in Christ, and it's hidden in Christ. Now look at what he says. He says, appears. When Christ, who is our life, appears. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about the, the second coming. Christ is coming again. Do you believe that? Christ will come again. And so <clears throat> if Jesus is coming again, it only makes sense that we should be looking and living for him on a continuous basis. Put all this together. Put it all together. When Christ who is our life appears, if you and I are looking for heaven on a daily basis, then guess what? We are seeking the things above. Our minds are set on things above. We're not concerned so much about the world. The temporary. We're seeking eternal things. Why? Because he says Christ is going to come again. We don't know when. And since we don't know when, what do we do? We watch. And we wait for his coming. And then look at what it says. You also will appear with him in glory. That word appear, it means to make visible the invisible. Alright? To make visible the invisible. 
So in other words, when Christ returns, the real position of the believer, that life that is such a mystery to the unregenerate, the life that we're talking about that is hidden in Christ, that is such a mystery to, to everyone around us that doesn't know Christ, been hidden to the world, it will be made known to them. It will appear. It will be made visible to them. Brother Caleb, you come. I started off with a question. I'm going to ask you that same question. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? Paul says you better be seeking those things from above. You better set your mind on things above. Well, let me ask you a different question. How diligently are you seeking Him? How hard are you searching after God? I'm going to give you one more verse. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I didn't forget it, all right? Look at it. Matter of fact, I believe this is one of the memory verses for this week in our, in our reading plan. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Who diligently seek him. So maybe the question this morning is not what are you seeking? Maybe the question is are you diligently seeking him? Are you going to? I would encourage you to. To hide, to seek, and to share. The sharing is simply sending somebody a text message of a verse. Picking up the phone and calling them, just saying, hey, I was just reading my Bible a little bit ago. I was praying, I was, I was reading, I was praying, and, and I read this verse, and God put your name on my mind, and I wanted to share it with you. Just proclaiming. As God speaks to you, you share it with someone else. But first, though, you got to hide. you got to get along with God. Get away from everyone else and anything else. And just you and God get along with it. Hide. Seek Him. Seek first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. Are you diligently seeking Him? I want you to bow your head for just a moment, all right? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Before we, before we have a time of invitation, we sang the song earlier. I'm going to tell you why we, why we sung that. Last week at the close of our service last week, he didn't even realize. He was playing that song, You Were My All in All. And as I was hearing, as I heard that song last week, I, I came to him and after I said, hey, you got to play that next Sunday. Because I'm going to remind you of a part of that song. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. It's so easy to give up. It's so easy to throw in the towel. It's easy in this day and age to say, well, I tried, it didn't work. But we can't be like that when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Diligently seek. He is a rewarder for those who diligently seek Him. Seek Him and search for Him with all your heart. And when you do, guess what? You're going to find Him. You're going to find life. An abundant life. An everlasting life. Eternal life. Life that this world can't offer you. And you honestly say, though, this morning, you don't have to say this out loud, but could you honestly say this morning, Jesus, you are enough. Jesus is enough. God, you are enough. I am sufficient. Christ, you are sufficient in my life. In you, Lord. 
I find sufficiency. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to surrender my heart. I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. I want you to be Lord of my life. When you surrender to Him, that is the beginning of a new life in Christ. This life that I'm talking about, it's a relationship. It's going to grow in so many ways as you follow the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, Jesus. Now, here's what's going to happen. you got an adversary. You've got an enemy. You've got the devil. The world. The flesh. Your sinful nature. The devil. They're going to do everything they can this week to keep you from following. To keep you from seeking after the kingdom of God and His righteousness. They're going to do everything they can to get you to follow other things. Other philosophies. Other experiences. So maybe this morning you just want to come to this altar and just say, Lord, I'm in a bag. I've not been seeking. I've been chasing everything else that this world offers. The Lord, starting today, right now, I'm making a renewed commitment to seek after you. To seek those things above. Would you pray this prayer? You don't have to pray it out loud. Would you just pray it where you're at? Jesus, you're everything to me. And don't pray it unless you mean it. Jesus, you're everything to me. Jesus, since you are my all in all, I will seek you with my whole heart. I surrender my will and control of my life to you. Jesus, as I abide in you, you provide everything I need to experience the abundant life. You are my all in all. This morning, as we sing, brother, lead us in a time. As we stand, as we sing, let me invite you to come. Humble yourself. Get on your knees. Come to an altar. Bring somebody with you. Hide. Seek. And share. Oh.